Hello everyone, welcome to Uplift. Today we are joined by David Payton, a pro-life economist. David, thank you for joining us again today on Uplift. It's uh, good to have you here with us. Um, so David, since the US Supreme Court has overturned Roe versus Wade, um, there seems to be a lot of you know, pro-abortion scaremongering uh, at an all-time high. The, the pro-abortion industry you know, claims that pro-life laws um, which, res which restrict abortion kill women. And that as abortion uh, access decreases, um, mortality rates will increase. Um, what are your views on this? It's interesting to see the reaction to um, Roe versus Wade being overturned. And I think lots of people just didn't pick up that it didn't um, abolish abortion. All it did was return the right to states to decide what their abortion laws would be. So it's about turning it back to democratically elected politicians. And I think that's an important point for everyone on both sides to remember. Indeed, you could be very pro-abortion and still support um, that elected politicians should be the ones to decide our laws. In terms of the, um, the discussion, I think it's not necessarily a bad thing that it's raised discussion about abortion, even in this country, you know, we've got a very different environment here. But you're right, people have raised concerns that when you make abortion illegal, that you potentially, um, you know, hit uh, maternal mortality rates and so on. Actually, the evidence on this is very mixed, we can say. Um, there's very little evidence, actually, that uh, restricting abortion in itself leads to higher maternal mortality rates. Um, you can see lots of examples of this in, in Ireland, for example, for many years where abortion was, uh, was illegal. Um, maternal mortality rates were not higher, if anything, they were probably lower than across the water in England, where abortion is legal up to birth in uh, many instances. And there's lots of cases like this we saw in, in Poland when they moved from a situation where, where abortion was very common and legal to uh, where it was effectively outlawed in most cases, and we've seen the same stories. Is this gonna, gonna affect women? In fact, maternal mortality rates have stayed low in Poland. Um, we've seen the, the case in Mexico where there've been some conflicting pieces of evidence, but the, I think the strongest evidence suggests that um, you know, legalization of abortion hasn't uh, you know, improved maternal mortality rates. Um, so you know, I, I think you, you certainly can't conclude that um, you know, restricting abortion is bad for women. It's of course, you know, if you're on the pro-life side, you, it's uh, the in terms of human rights, it's a right to both the, the baby and the mother. You know, it protects both partners having laws that, that say it's not okay to um, for an unborn baby to be killed. But in terms of the practical empirical evidence, it's certainly not uh, not, not the case that there's strong evidence that um, criminalizing abortion does lead to adverse impacts for um, women's health. Yeah, interesting. And so it's a wide held belief that, you know, improving sex education and ensuring easier access to um, contraception will lower abortion rates. Uh, and yet recently in the UK, we've seen that uh, abortion rates seem to climb at the highest, you know, uh, on record at the moment. Um, and so is there any evidence in, in your opinion to suggest that sex education and contraception um, are lowering abortion rates? Yeah, there's lots of evidence on that topic, looking at empirical evidence when you introduce a particular sex education scheme or mandatory sex education, what happens to teenage pregnancy, unwanted pregnancy. Um, so we had a paper published in Health Economics um, a couple of years ago, looking across the world at countries that have implemented mandatory sex education laws where schools have to teach sex education. And the evidence is fairly clear in the, in the negative sense that there's no evidence that this leads to lower rates of teenage pregnancies and abortions. In fact, if anything, we found that countries having mandatory sex education had high rates or increases, if you like, in teenage pregnancy rates. There's some evidence that when you include parents in this decision, so you allow parents to opt out of sex education, that sort of limits some of the bad effects of mandatory sex education. This shouldn't be a surprise, that was a paper. There's not so much evidence looking at the laws on mandatory sex education. There's lots of evidence looking at the impact of sex education programs themselves. And there's some randomized controlled trials and there's the Cochrane um, reviews. They do reviews of reviews of evidence. So they're sort of seen as a gold standard for looking at these sorts of things. Their latest evidence on the impact of sex education in schools on unwanted pregnancy essentially concludes that the evidence is that there, there is no strong effect. It certainly doesn't seem to lead to reduced uh, teenage pregnancies or STIs. Uh, and that's when, you, you know, you, there's lots of studies out there so you can pick out studies on both sides of the debate, but that's sort of the gold standard saying 
well, on balance, there's no real evidence that this has much of an effect. So I, I don't think that should, that's not a controversial view. That's not a pro-life view. That's from the Cochrane uh, systematic um, reviews. That doesn't mean, by the way, that there's not necessarily a role for schools to provide some sort of sex education. Um, you, you may well think that schools can help parents in delivering you know, important information to children at different ages. I think what it does do is say, you know, parents are sometimes told, oh, you have to have this sort of comprehensive, very early, very explicit style of sex education because all, all the evidence suggests that it leads to better outcomes for children. So, you know, we have to go down this, this route. Actually, the evidence is not there at all on that. There's no evidence of better outcomes in terms of uh, sexual health outcomes for children. So I think that in a, in a way that's quite liberating because it means we can go back and think, right, what type of information do we want to give children in schools? At what age? How do we want to present it? What's the role of, of parents? And we need to move away from this idea that this should be sort of one size fits all, that all schools have to provide sex education from the age of four or five. And we have to have this very sort of explicit type of curriculum. The evidence just doesn't support that type of approach. Mm. So in your opinion, then, what policies could help to decrease um, abortion rates? OK, so you, you, you have to look much more fundamentally at the culture, you know, the, the you know, there's some evidence that some laws relating to abortion do have an impact. So a law restricting abortion does lead to lower abortion rates. The evidence is fairly clear on that. Um, so there are laws relating to that, for example, on parental, parental involvement. I think it'd be a very uh, you know, easy change when we're looking at younger ages, at least. We look at states in America that have mandated parental parents being informed or given consent before minors are allowed abortions. At the moment in England, that's not the case. You can be 13 or 14 and a school can take you for an abortion or you can, uh, somebody can take you for an abortion and your parents don't even have to know it's happened. So a law that mandates parents at least being told and being involved in that decision um, is the right thing to do anyway, but also there's evidence that it leads to lower abortion rates. It doesn't lead necessarily to higher birth rates amongst teenagers. It actually seems to lead to fewer uh, teenagers getting pregnant in the first instance. Okay, uh, and there's other uh, beneficial impacts that have been found as well in terms of lower rates of STI. So that's, you know, th there are areas, I think, where we can look to uh, limit, limit abortion. And of course, as a matter of justice, it's right that laws should protect unborn children. But we have to be realistic in the political world of, of where, you know, um, public opinion and our, our MPs are in terms of what can be achieved. You can also look more fundamentally. So there, there is evidence that um, deeper cultural issues do have big impacts on uh, teenage pregnancy, on abortion rates, so looking at um, poverty and employment and um, educational outcomes. So certainly the case in terms of teenage pregnancy, not necessarily the mix between abortions and pregnancies, that when schools are better and, and uh, youngsters in poor areas have got sort of more prospects, if you like, and uh, you know, got better schooling outcomes, that that leads to lower rates of early sexual activity and lower rates of teenage pregnancy. Um, family breakup is a very important issue. So policies that support the family tend to lead to lower rates of very early sexual activity and ultimately in lower rates of teenage pregnancy and, and abortion. So there are these sort of deeper cultural issues, which are you know, much harder for governments to influence. But, but I think it's a, there's a tendency for governments to say, well, you know, here's a problem. OK, we've got high rates of abortion. How do we tackle it? Oh, sex education or giving young people condoms or the morning after pill. And it seems obvious that that will have an impact but actually the evidence suggests it does not lead to lower rates of teenage pregnancy. And, and we can sort of think through why that might be in terms of the how people's behaviour changes in response to those sorts of policies. Um, but whatever the reason for it, you can't get away from the evidence that um, those policies don't seem to be effective in reducing pregnancies and abortion rates. So when pro-life laws are introduced and abortion rates decrease, is there any evidence to tell us then what happens to those pregnancies that could have been ended in abortion? Uh, do childbirth or adoption um, rates increase instead, for example? So when um, if abortion is um, made illegal in a particular circumstance, there's several things that could potentially happen. It could be that that abortion takes place anyway, perhaps illegally or perhaps in another jurisdiction where it's where it's legal. It may be that that pregnancy goes to term and the, and the woman gives birth um, and then there could be an adoption or they may decide to keep the baby. It's also possible, though, that in response to a law change, um, some of those pregnancies that would have ended in abortion, people never get pregnant in the first place. And I think that's an aspect that people often forget. Now, the pro-abortion side say, well, 
pretty much always, you know, the abortion will happen anywhere. It's only a question of where it takes place. Uh, but actually, the, the evidence suggests that probably there's some element of all three of those things happening. So, you know, if a, in a, if a state in America makes abortion illegal, yet some women may go to the neighbouring state and still have an abortion. But there's all there's evidence that uh, not only do abortions uh, decrease when abortion is made more difficult, but there tend to be fewer pregnancies or unwanted pregnancies in the first place. So we do get go back and there is an element that people make decisions earlier on about um, risky sexual activity when they perhaps don't want to get pregnant. And behaviour does change in response to anticipated laws. So I'm, I'm an economist and we, you know, people often think about, you know, we think about rational behaviour and people making decisions, looking at the costs and benefits of things. And you know, it's, it looks a bit, sounds a bit funny sometimes for economists to think of things in this way. But what we're, we're saying is, you know, you're perhaps a 15 year old and you're, you're maybe facing pressure from your boyfriend or maybe from your girlfriend to, to have sex. And you don't, you're not sure if you really want to. And you're worried about getting pregnant. Well, you know, depend, for some people, you're not going to have an abortion, whatever, because of perhaps your religious beliefs. Other people know if they get pregnant, well, they'll, they'll find a way of having an abortion. But for some people, it's something that I don't really want to happen. But they feel, rightly or wrongly, that if they get pregnant, well, at least abortion's there and, you know, I won't have to give up my school or university. When you know that abortion is more difficult, or perhaps, you know, my parents are now going to be told if I have an abortion, that can change your original decision making and make you a little, you know, perhaps be a little bit more resistant to early sexual activity. It doesn't mean everyone responds in that way, but some people will, will do. OK, and this is what, what we can look at the evidence. And it does seem to be the case. The evidence on abortion law suggests that you end up with fewer unwanted pregnancies, fewer abortions. In some studies, an increase, a smaller increase, if you like, in the number of births that take place. So it, it, essentially all those elements happen. But it's absolutely not the case when people say, well, abortions are going to happen anyway, irrespective of the law. It's only whether they happen safely or not. The evidence doesn't support that. There may be some element, of course, sort of some abortions will happen in different jurisdictions, but actually the, the evidence is that, you know, fewer abortions do take place. Great. Um, so we know that obviously teenage pregnancy is an ongoing discussion here in the UK um, and that a recent Care Quality Commission report have shown that abortion um, giants such as BPAS um, perform surgical abortions on girls under uh, the age of 16. Um, what can we do or what policies do you suggest to be put in place to protect underage and vulnerable girls in particular from explo exploitation um, at the hands of the abortion industry? Yeah, so, so, so there's a really serious safeguarding issue with the, uh, the current policy in the UK on the provision of abortions to minors, because at the moment, parents don't have to be even informed that the, uh, a minor has had an abortion. And there have been a number of serious case reviews where this has been identified as a way in which um, child sexual exploitation has been perpetuated. So the point when a, when a young girl gets who's being exploited, perhaps with an older partner and gets pregnant, um, and goes for an abortion. That's an obvious point of intervention where you can identify safeguarding. But one of the problems is that um, children are assured that sexual health services, including abortion, are absolutely confidential and they won't, parents won't be told unless they, the, the child wants them to be under the so-called Gillick competence. And Gillick rules on um, providing these sort of services to under 16s so was meant to be in very rare cases, but actually it's become, uh, become normalised. So it's provided inverted commas confidential, confidentially, but we can say secretly. So these serious case reviews have identified cases where the response to say a 13 or 14 or 15 year old getting pregnant has often been for a school nurse or a sexual health services to, to go for an abortion or a GP to um, authorize an abortion. And of course that has sometimes ended up with the abuser being able to carry on with the abuse. So in every case where an under 16 year old is going for a termination, there is a there should be a safeguarding issue and it should be treated in that in that way. So I think in terms of the law, there's a couple of things that could be done. Firstly, to treat every case of a termination or an abortion from the 16 year old as a potential safeguarding issue. The second one is to have laws like many US states do where parents have to be involved in that decision. Obviously there's exceptions for when, you know, it's suspected that the parent is, is a source of the, of the abuse. So you, you obviously have, you know, potential safeguarding issues there, but as a general rule, it should be the case if an under 16 goes for treatment, like um, a serious treatment, like an abortion, parents have to be informed and have to provide their, their consent. And I think that would be a simple 
law change that that you know people on both sides of the abortion debate should really come round to support. Bilbo Pivotal. Uh, so at times, and you know, in culture, it seems that um, you know, abortion is so embedded in society. What can someone who's um, uh, you know pro-life? What is the most use- useful thing that they can do um, at the moment in society? Well, it, it, I mean, it can be daunting. You know, society. Um, it often gives the appearance of, of not being sympathetic to the pro-life point of view. I think, uh, you know, you, you have to put that to one side a little bit because sometimes that's the impression given on some aspects of social media, on, um, you know, some of the media. I think the general public opinion is often quite different, particularly on the free speech side of things. So I think people, uh, you know, do want to have it. They do understand, even if they think abortion should be legal, that it's a really serious issue and that there are valid views on, uh, you know, on the pro-life side that, that, that deserve a hearing. And I think that's sometimes a starting point because we often see with the pro-abortion side, it's not a question of just, you know, debating and giving their view. What they try to do is actually to shut up people on the pro-life side to sort of the cancel culture. So we see this at universities where they'll protest even against a pro-life speaker being brought onto a campus. They'll protest against a pro-life group being formed on campus by students, even if there's a pro-abortion group. Uh, and, you know, that, that's really negative um, you know, de- development, I think, that people see, they focus on the individuals and they try and sort of focus on you. Oh, if you associate with pro-lifers, you know, you're seen as something undesirable. And that, that's sort of the impression you try to give. So the first thing I think pro-lifers have to do is to speak up for free speech and be very insistent that whatever your views on abortion, we have the right to be heard. And there is a case, there is a strong case for the pro-life point of view. Um, and we mustn't be cowed. That's a really important fight. It's, you know, where, where necessary, the law is often on the side of free speech and pro-lifers have to be prepared to use it and not um, just sort of yield when somebody says, oh, no, you can't be saying that sort of thing in this environment. So that, that's the first thing. The second thing is, I think, is you can worry too much about the big picture. It's not our job as pro-lifers. We're not responsible for changing people's mind. We can only propose valid scientific arguments we mustn't go we mustn't go sort of beyond what the evidence shows you know there's lots of good empirical evidence that is consistent with the pro-life point of view in the end it's a matter of principle and ethics that it's never right for the law to say that an unborn uh, that an innocent human being can be uh, can be directly killed but we pro-lifers need to be sympathetic of course to understand the serious situations that women face in difficult pregnancies uh, and provide practical support, but also to educate people, because I think so many people out there who sort of, you know, instinct is to say, oh, yeah, we don't think the law should be changed on abortion, really don't know about the development of the unborn baby, about the different stages, that there's a heartbeat from perhaps as early as three weeks after conception. And that educational um, programme is, is perhaps the most important thing we can do. But everything pro-lifers do should be done, of course, with love, and understanding firmly, you know, we have to stick by principles and not accept that it's ever um, right for innocent people, you know, vulnerable people, both mothers and unborn babies, to be neglected by the law. But we must do it with with love, with understanding, with sympathy. Uh, and I think that's the way you and um, people understand that they're first of all that yes, there is a different side of the coin. Perhaps you haven't heard before, and then people start to think about the science and about the logic and about the ethics and that it's about supporting both the unborn baby and his or her mother. Great, very well said. Uh, So thank you David for joining us today, it was a pleasure speaking with you in studio and hopefully I'll get to meet you in person one day. Uh, So yeah, have a lovely day and it was great chatting with you. Thanks everyone for tuning in, see you again next week where we'll have more influential guests lined up.